The sound of women in the woods screaming in terror are gone because Ted Bundy is now dead. But when he was alive, he would take many of his victims into the mountains, the hidden hills, where they could not be heard nor get away from him or be found. So many women, so many young girls lost in the woods. In the end, Ted really couldn't remember how many girls and women he had murdered, but by the last hour, he just didn't care anymore. This is the story of Ted Bundy and his last few minutes of confessions. When talking about Ted, you are wrapped up in his life, whether you want to be or not, in one way or another. Put yourself in the shoes of Bundy back in January of 1989. It's your last few hours alive. There's no way you are getting out of walking to that chair made of wood for a reason. It has large leather straps that can and will hold you down to allow it to kill you. And it's just down the hall from where you sleep on death row in a room where people you hurt and upset will watch you die. Ted's last week alive would be a different side of Ted. Ted would be practicing a term called Bones for Time in which he would break character and show his real side. He was a cold, heartless killer. When Ted would first say that he wanted to make a deal to confess, he would use it as a way to have control of the situation, or so he thought. But he would have some control over it, giving counts of the abductions, but controlling the narrative of how much he would confess to, trying to stay alive himself. Ted was more looking at women that were still missing. Bundy would make it known in almost all the interviews that he was wanting to focus on the locations of where the bones could maybe be, but not go into much detail of what he did with the victims. Ted would come clean with many of the murders that he was known to have done, and then a handful of ones the authorities did not even know about. Ted would confess to so many murders that he had been holding on to for over 10 years. During the confession, he would even get mixed up, which, when you really think about it, is even more disheartening. You can see that many of them were just a quick fix to Ted's murder impulse, like a drug addict trying to get a fix. And that's how we start talking about one of the first confessions, digging into Ted's memory with him. One of the biggest mysteries that Ted was suspected in was the murder of 16-year-old Nancy Wilcox. Ted would even go on tape confessing in detail about when and how he took Nancy from what he could remember. There are two different versions of Ted's confession of Nancy. The one that is on tape seems to go right with what witnesses say. It was 15 years later with a lot of other women in Ted's mind. The taking of Nancy Wilcox was a little different when it came to what Bunny usually did. Bunny said he would not lure Nancy with stories or a trick. Ted would say he saw Nancy on the side of the road walking, that it was a long, dark road with very tall lampposts spread far apart with one light bulb in each of the lampposts. Ted pulled up ahead of her, jumped out of his car, and took Nancy by force with a knife. Ted was asked if he had had conversation with Nancy in the middle of taking her. Ted would kind of just mutter that there was no conversation due to the fact that he had thrown Nancy in his car at knife point. And Nancy, obviously, is kicking and screaming. When Bunny had Nancy in the car, he would drive up around a corner to where it was very dark. When he pulled over, this is when he said he would subdue Nancy and put her in handcuffs. Now this is where the story has two different versions, but we are going off the version that Ted says on tape. Ted said that he would take Nancy back to his apartment for the next 24 hours, where he would spend half the night assaulting her, and somewhere in the middle of the night, he would kill her. Ted had taken another huge risk with taking Nancy 
out in the open, so close to her home, with a knife. When Ted is confessing to the abduction of Nancy Wilcox, he would make a comment and say that he was in a real bad state, more than likely meaning his impulse was taking over, and he just had to find someone to kill. Ted would say while he was at the apartment with Nancy, she would only be alive halfway through the night. Ted was asked several times, how did he kill Nancy? But he would not give in to how. He was asked did he use a weapon, and he said no. More than not, from Bundy's other confessions about when he took women to his apartment, we know that most of the time he either strangled them or would drown them in his tub. Bundy said the next day, that night, around 12 a.m., he would load Nancy back in his Volkswagen and take her far away into the mountains to dispose of her body. Still to this day, Nancy has never been found. Nancy's disappearance would go unknown for 15 years, till two days before Ted was to be executed. Nancy seemed to fall right in the same pattern of Ted's victims. Ted would drive around, park his car, nearby a school or place where he knew young women would be. This is what would seem to happen to Nancy. We now know that Ted stalked a lot of his earlier victims in the beginning when he had time to stalk and take his time. When you dig into a lot of the first murders around his home, Ted was seen at parties, around parks, and even met some of his victims weeks earlier. This is something Ted would confess in interviews, talking about his stalking, and even now, family and friends of the earlier victims said that there was a man named Ted talking to their loved ones days or weeks before they disappeared. Nancy's sister would say years later that she started thinking about conversations her and Nancy had days before her disappearance. She said that Nancy was talking about a man that would come through the drive through at her work and flirt with her and even say he was a law student. Nancy's sister even recalled a time when Nancy was sitting in the front room window of their home and saw the same man drive by her house. This is also very important because Nancy was taken just hundreds of feet from her home. When Ted tells the story of what he could recall of the Nancy Wilcox abduction, the man interviewing Ted would ask him, now what about Nancy Barrett? Ted became confused and said, I thought we were talking about Nancy Wilcox. The interviewer said, Yes, but there's another girl named Nancy Baird. Ted seemed confused and said he didn't know anything about that girl. The story of Nancy Baird is very interesting. Still to this day, she has never been found, and Ted is still the number one suspect in her disappearance. Baird, 23, was a young woman who went missing on July 4th, 1975, in East Layton, Utah. She was working her shift at a gas station. Ted would say that he had nothing to do with the disappearance. When looking at the case of Nancy Baird, the only thing that we can look at is Nancy herself. She does not fit the profile of Ted's victims 100%, other than she is 23 and a woman, but is a single mother with blonde hair. Ted is still the number one suspect in Nancy's disappearance. The next two women that we will be talking about are Debbie Kent and Susan Curtis. Debbie is 17 years old and Curtis is 15 years old. The story of Debbie Kent and Susan Curtis are that they lived in the same neighborhood and attended the same school and would be murdered by the same man, Ted Bundy. Debbie Kent was a similar case like Nancy Wilcox. Ted would even confess to Deborah Kent in the same interview that he confessed to Nancy Wilcox in back to back. Deborah had just disappeared, but there was more evidence to go on in her case. On the night of November 8th in 1974, Deborah was with her family attending a play at her school. At 10:10 10, 10 p.m., she left the school building. Deborah's parents had asked her to go pick up her brother from a local skating rink. As Deborah was walking to the family car, this is when Bunny would see her and from what we know forcefully grab her. A witness would later say he heard a young woman screaming in the parking lot. As the play ended, Deborah's parents would walk out to find the family car still in the same spot where they parked it. This is when they would contact the police. When the police arrived, the only evidence they would find was a key. This key would turn out to be a huge clue 
when detectives would find Bundy months later with handcuffs. This key belonged to a pair of handcuffs that Bundy had. The same handcuffs he had used that morning when he tried to abduct Carol Durant. Carol Durant is one of the only women to actually come in contact with Bundy to see his tricks, to be in the vehicle with him. November 8th, the same day he took Deborah Kent, Carol Durant would have been the woman that was abducted and murdered that day, but she was able to free herself from Bundy. Ted would find Carol in a shopping mall and tell her that he was an undercover cop and that her car had been broken into and he needed her to come with him right away. This is one of the only times where we have an eyewitness where she said she could smell alcohol on Bundy. Why this is interesting is because many people do not believe that Bundy ever drank during his murders. Although Bundy claims himself and has said in confessions that he would heavily drink before abducting women to loosen his nerves and help him go through with what he was about to do. Carol would say that Bundy smelled of alcohol, which was the first thing that made her suspicious of the situation. When she would willingly get in Ted's Volkswagen, the pace would change very fast as Ted would try to handcuff her, but Carol would put up such a fight that Ted was forced to stop the vehicle to where Carol jumped out with the handcuffs still on her hand and now would be in the hands of police. Now fast forwarding back to that night, November 8th, where Deborah Kent was abducted, there would be another eyewitness that would confirm Bundy at the school that night. Her name was Raylan Shepard. Raylan was a drama teacher at the school. She said that Bundy approached her that night, saying that he needed help in the parking lot with his vehicle. She said he was very intense and in insisting that he needed her help, her specifically. She said she was not going and with that saved her life. Raylan claims that same night after the play was done that she saw Bundy back in the auditorium looking disheveled, hair somewhat messy, a little sweaty, and obviously trying to make an alibi. Later when she was asked, Raylan would give an unbelievable statement about the man she saw that night. His posture, his clothes, his attitude, his mustache. She had multiple run-ins with Ted that day. By the end of that night, Ted's face was sketched in her mind. It said that Deborah Kent walked out at 10.10 p.m. that night and 20 minutes later, around 10.30, this is when Raylan said she saw Bundy. This is not out of the ordinary for Ted at all. He would show up before and after crimes were committed. This was something that he said, and we know he did quite a bit. When Bundy is confessing to the murder, Ted would say that when he found Deborah in the parking lot, he took her, put her in his Volkswagen, and drove straight to his apartment, where he held her for 24 hours. Bundy said the first 12 hours she would be alive, and the last 12 she would be deceased. Bundy would not go into detail at how he murdered her, but much like Nancy Wilcox, either strangulation or drowning in his tub. And like a creature of habit, he would load Deborah back up the next night into his Volkswagen and drive up to the mountains and dispose of her body. Deborah's disappearance and murder would go unknown for 15 years until Bundy confessed to it just one day before his execution. The only thing that would be found 15 years later, when Bunny would give the location of where he dumped Kent, was a piece of bone from her knee that would later be identified through DNA that it was Deborah Kent. Susan Curtis would also be a last minute confession from Bundy. She was a 15 year old girl who stood around 5'7". Ted would not relay much detail into her disappearance, very short details of the abduction and murder. Due to loss of memory about the crime or just not wanting to go into detail, the day Susan disappeared, she was attending a conference at Brigham Young University on June 27, 1975. She would disappear while attending the conference. Ted would confess that he took a girl from Brigham Young University campus in June of 1975. With what time he spent talking about Susan, he would look at maps and try to identify where he hid her body, but would not go into detail about the abduction or the murder. Her body has never been found, and still to this day, not much is known about her abduction or her death. But one of the last known murders that Bundy would call someone in to confess to is the abduction and murder of Lynette Culver. Lynette was just 12 years old and would vanish from school on her lunch break. Just hours, minutes before he was to be executed, 
Ted would confess to the murder and abduction of Lynette. He would not give much detail at all. At this point, it's just an hour or so before Ted is to be executed. It's said that he is tired, he is crying off and on again, and he is visibly just shaken. When he has this last confession, there's not much to it. It's dark, it's grim, and to the point. Ted said he abducted Lynette. He took her to a Holiday Inn where he assaulted her through the night. He said he would later drown her in a bathtub and dump her body in the Snake River. Still to this day, no remains of her have ever been found. When Ted is confessing to this murder, he leaves a clue behind. Ted said that Lynette was talking about her grandmother quite a bit and that she was moving. Ted could have been talking to her days prior or just simply putting two and two together from stalking her. This is Ted's last confession and last chance to stay alive. His confessions have gone from a 40 minute ramble to a five minute bullet point of a sick and twisted person that has ran out of options, time, and people to cling to. When Bundy would have his trial about his sorority murders, the one element that would lead Ted to be found guilty and sitting in the electric chair was a bite mark that he left on Lisa Levy. Lisa Levy had teeth marks throughout her body where Ted bit her, breaking the skin and bruising and leaving a permanent implant of his teeth. Ted would fight this in court very hard. Being his own lawyer, he would say this was impossible and that there's no way that this can be proven that these were his teeth. A cast had already been made of Ted's teeth that would be used in court. When looking at Ted's teeth, they are very unique. They have twists and turns, jagged edges, and his front teeth are damaged. Even one of them is chipped. More than likely comes from fighting women that were trying to get away, fighting for their life. In Bundy's last hours, confessing, he is more open than he ever has been. He is talking about his feelings, his urges that led him here, trying to openly and honestly understand himself. Bundy would say in these same interviews, that he would call this thing in him, this force, that consumed him. Ted said that he would go to college campuses, parks, parties, simply just looking for women, and most of the time, just following them. And he said, that's how it started. He just simply started following and stalking women. Bunny would say he would be out late at night, just following people like that. Ted said, I would try not to, but I would end up doing it anyway. Ted talks in this language a lot, in the third person, talking about this impulse he developed in his teens that took over his life in his 20s. Ted said he tried to suppress it. It was taking more and more of my time. That's why I didn't do well in school. My time was being used, trying to make my life look normal, but I wasn't normal. Bundy later told the Washington police he had killed eight people in Utah the authorities in Utah would later come out that they said they believed that Ted was involved in at least 11 deaths in the state of Utah, including some as early as 1971 and as late as 1976. While Ted was in prison on death row for 10 years, he had made a life as much as he could being married to Carol Boone, having a child. It seems unbelievable that the man that killed and mutilated maybe 50 women and little girls would have a child that would be a little girl. They would name her Rose. But in the last week of Ted confessing, Ted's wife would break all contact with him when she found out that Ted was not the innocent man that he claimed to be. In the end, Bunny had no family or real friends there with him when he was to be executed. The night before his death, he had a conversation with his mother on the phone. Not long, but just enough to say goodbye. This would be the last contact he had with any family or anybody that he knew from his past life. Bundy chose Reverend Fred Lawrence to pastor him through his last night on earth. Fred had been with men that had been executed before, walking them through it and helping them through the situation. Knowing this, Bundy asked him to be there by his side before he was executed. Fred was able to describe to Ted what would happen to him in the chamber. He told Ted he would be strapped in, then offered a chance to speak. Then the leather hood 
would fall over his face, and his headpiece would be attached. He would hear the duel of the noise of the circuits being opened, and a second later, the current would hit him. He told Ted he should not fear pain. Bundy listened with his elbows resting on his knees. He then reached his hands through the bars. Fred opened up his hands to receive Bundy's hands and held them. He said Ted squeezed his hands for nearly 10 minutes straight. Fred would also say, Ted never said a word. He just held my hands tighter than anyone had ever held my hands. The last four minutes, he raised his head and gazed into my eyes, still not speaking, just gazed intensely. I didn't see fear or uncertainty. He just seemed to want to hang on a little bit longer before he disappeared. It was like holding on to a dead man. Fred spent the night outside Bundy's cell. Part of the time they spent in prayer. The time had come. The men that would walk with Ted came to his cell and said, It's time, Ted. Ted would get up from his bed and leave the cell, walking to the chair that he knew would take his life. It's not a far walk. It's a grisly walk, the white pale lights, the thought of will you feel pain, what is death, people's faces that I've killed, family, friends, the life I could have had, what is my little girl up to. These are all things that Ted could have been thinking about. As Ted walked in the chamber and saw the chair for the first time, it said that he was pale, white as a ghost, but was calm and knew there was no way out of it. On the other side of the glass were authorities lawyers, witnesses, victims, families, and people that were helping Ted in the end, 42 people in all, would watch as Ted was executed. Fred was on the front row, looking at Ted the whole time, making eye contact, assuring him that everything would be fine. Bundy was asked if he had any last words. It said that Ted's voice broke slightly as he spoke. Looking at Fred, he said, I'd like to give my love to my family and friends those are the last words Ted would say. At this point, Ted was strapped into the chair. Everything was ready to go. After Ted finished talking, the chin strap was tightened on his face. It said that Ted closed his eyes tightly for 10 seconds straight and then opened them as wide as he could, looking straight on. One of the officers took the black leather hood and lowered it in front of Ted's face. They then attached a metal electrode to the top of Bundy's shaved head. A phone call was made to see if there was any last stays. There were not. At that point, the warden looked at the executioner, nodded his head. The executioner pressed the button, releasing the voltage that would run through the chair through Bundy at 7.06 a.m., sending 2,000 volts at 14 amps surging through Ted's body. It said that Ted pressed backwards into the chair, his fists clenched tightly. The power was on for about a minute, and a half, the time normally allowed. At the minute and a half, the chair was turned off. A paramedic checked Bundy's pulse at his wrist for four minutes before unbuckling the strap across his chest and listening to his heart. Dr. Frank Kilgo, the chief physician at Florida State Prison, lifted the mask from Bundy's face and shined a light into the cool eyes that were staring straight ahead and would say, he's dead. At that point, it was 17.16 a.m. Ted Bundy was pronounced dead. Ted's execution would be clean, fast, and precise. The person that pushed the button for Ted to be executed was paid $150 to do so. After the execution, Ted would be loaded up on a gurney and wheeled outside into a hearse. When Ted's body is leaving in the hearse, people that were outside cheering and waiting will still be screaming and yelling as they are happy Ted is dead. When Ted's body arrives to its next destination, it will be taken out and taken straight to a morgue. His body will still be heavily guarded at this point. Pictures will be taken of Ted before and after his autopsy. When the autopsy is performed, it's said that they will take half of Ted's brain. From this point on, Ted's body will immediately be taken and cremated. And for all that, there's no more of Ted. Not a hair is left. He is gone. As Ted's soul and body is gone from this world now, there's one thing that's not gone from this world. It's the hurt and pain that Ted caused. Still to this day, families, generations are hurt and not the same. This was the story of Ted Bundy and his last few confessions on death row. Thank you so much for listening to this point. 
But until we talk next time, remember, be careful who you take rides from. Thank you.